Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alexa Von Tobel, and this week, I'm excited for you to meet Athena Calderon, founder and CEO of lifestyle brand iSwoon. Athena is a New York-based interior designer, author, chef, and entertaining expert. Athena is one of the largest influencer entrepreneurs with over a million Instagram followers. Known for her distinctive approach that spans both food and design, Athena has built a career out of the business of home. Since its 2012 launch, iSwoon has grown from an editorial platform into a full-blown e-commerce destination with thriving online community that celebrates the art of living. Athena is the author of two best-selling books. In 2017, she released the James Beard award-winning cookbook, Cook Beautiful, quickly followed by the best-selling interior design book, Live Beautiful. The latter has gone on to sell over 300,000 copies worldwide. In 2021, Athena released a rug collection to critical acclaim. This was followed by a blockbuster collaboration with Crate and Barrel in 2022, the collection was a runaway success, surpassing its yearly sales projection in the first 60 days. She's also gone on to expand her design practice, Studio Athena Calderon, with multiple luxury residential interior design projects, including her role as creative director and lead designer for a boutique condo building in downtown Manhattan. Athena has simply led the way as influencer entrepreneur. And with that, I'm so excited to welcome my friend, Athena. Hi, Athena. Excited to have you. First, Athena, I'm thrilled to have you here today. You are one of the more interesting entrepreneur founders that we've had on because you are really a big multi-hyphenate entrepreneur. My first question is, describe what you do in simplest terms and what is iSwoon to you? Oh, goodness. What I do. and Well, first of all, let me back up for one moment. I am so honored to be having this conversation with you and I'm so happy to have met you this year at kind of this you know, incredible crossroads of the growth of my brand and business. But I guess to answer your question, what it is that I do, I will say first and foremost that I'm ever evolving. And it's been very hard to pinpoint and to say in a little sound bite exactly what I do. But um, I wear many hats. I'm a creative director. I'm an interior designer. I'm a writer. I'm an author. I am a storyteller. I love to create environments. I love to connect with community. I love to share my creative process and journey. And I didn't know all of those things about myself when I started iSpoon. iSpoon started as um, a Tumblr page. And it started as a place for me to house all the things that I love. Um, I was a very young mom. Well, I won't say very, but I was a young mom when I started iSwoon. Um, and it started because in my 20s, I was at home. I didn't have career yet. I got married young. I had a baby at 26. And iSwoon was a way for me to find both passion and purpose and self-expression because I've always been a creative, but I didn't really have a place for that creativity to land. And my home became this workshop where I started to express myself and started to find passion and purpose and creativity. And that really happened in the kitchen and it happened through travel and design and making my homes beautiful. So iSwim was just a place for me to share everything I was learning. I didn't find success as a career woman or have success as a um, a businesswoman until my 30s, my mid 30s, to be honest. How do you think about patience? Because I believe patience is critical to building really exceptional businesses. But how do you think about patience? As an interior designer, I'm very patient as well. I'll never settle. I'll never settle on anything. I really need to find what feels authentic. And whether that's what I say, whether that's what I write, whether that's how I design, it needs to feel authentic in order for it to be true. And authenticity doesn't happen like this in a flash. It does take time to find your voice or find the right piece of furniture that, that's going to sing in a room. I think that people settle very often. And I think, sorry to jump the gun, but one of your questions was like, what was something I learned from my parents? And I think, and I was thinking to myself, like, my mom always taught me to never settle. 
I don't know if I would describe myself as patient, but now that you're asking me that, I guess I just refuse to settle. Everybody out there listening is a business person or an entrepreneur trying to build their business. How do you think about authenticity and getting that right? And what does it really mean? And again, you've done it incredibly well. So we want to learn from you. Give us your master's class on authenticity as you build your brand. You can only be you, right? And I think that every time I've tried to be what someone else is, I fall on my face. And anytime I put blinders on and I just be me, I mean, look, there was, as I was figuring out who I was, I always felt like I gave up on things, probably because I was this hummingbird that kept trying all these different things. But I did have a bit of shame that like I kept trying things on for size and I felt like none of it was leading me anywhere. I now know that each of those things did lead me to this place I'm at right now. But I always wanted to understand what's the common thread when I develop a recipe when I style an outfit, when I style a photo, when I design a space, what is this thing that connects and unites all the things that I do? So almost like what are these like um, these tenets of how I approach creativity? And, you know, I started to identify that I love kind of friction and contrast and I love the unexpected and I, I don't want to be what other people are being. So I think to answer your question, like, you know, find that thing that fires you up, that makes you unique, maybe that people poke at you to, and make fun of you. Like my mom and my childhood best friend would always like say to me growing up, like, oh, Athena, her head's up in the clouds. She starts something. She doesn't finish it. I am a dreamer. I am curious. I do ask questions all the time. I do like to push boundaries. I do like to create a new roadmap. Does it come with a lot of uncertainties and insecurities and constantly questioning and feeling like you're in a misstep? Yeah, it does. And it always will. Your gut check could be if it feels icky sometimes because you're paving your own way. I want to dive in a little bit to I Swoon. When in your mind did I Swoon go from being your passion, this outlet, this creative outlet for you? to being a company, a real business in your head? Like, what was that day? What was that aha moment? Like, I I will say, has been my greatest teacher. You know, I learned so much about myself through this journey, like how to write better, how to style better, how to be a good collaborator, a good storyteller, and a visual storyteller, but also through the written word, how to become a teacher, how to like because the content, I will just back up for a minute, the content was at the core of what I Swoon was for a very long time. And it was really just kind of like sharing, you know, the creative process and the creative journey. And then it became a business through collaborations with brands and through doing creative direction, to, through, you know, a brand hiring me to create create a world, to dive into the DNA of a brand and kind of understand who they are and tell their story through the lens of Icewind, which was through food and through design. So I would say the first kind of iteration of it becoming a viable monetized business was through collaborations and working with brands and putting that on my social media channels and creating events. A lot of what I was doing was creating beautiful events where I would take everything that, you know, this brand voice and share it through this experience, you know, whether it was like creating, you know, a menu that I was sharing the recipes flowers, lighting, music. You know, I've also been like working with the photographers and hiring a videographer and even working with my husband on the music. So I swoon almost, I've never really defined it in this way, but I swoon almost became like this little mini creative agency where like I was handling the production of these events, you know, hiring the creative teams, collaborate, like I get so fired up from collaboration. So I would say that community, creativity, collaboration is at the core of what iSwoon was for a very long time. And I started to have employees that would kind of help me editorially write the stories, help me capture the content. But it really wasn't until the past like year and a half where I ended up working with somebody that really helped me identify that like, yes, the storytelling and the content is what people want from you. 
but people also want the product. And I started to look at kind of the data of like people wanted to shop from me. And really within the past year and a half, I took iSwim from just a content machine into commerce. Starting an e-commerce platform was something I knew nothing about. And I understand a language that I did not understand in this past year. I've always called myself a creative and a storyteller and a creative director, but like now I'm a businesswoman. And in the past, you know, 18 months, I've gone from two employees to six employees. And I know that for many founders, that might sound really small, but it feels enormous for me. For the rest of us who have much smaller communities than you, how do you manage your community? What are the kind of simple rules and practices maybe that you can share with us and pay it forward to us so that we can learn from you? I never wanted beauty to be the only thing that I share. I think that I am generous in the information that I share with my community, and I think that I'm vulnerable. I have always been a super curious person. I've always felt a little bit less than. So I've always wanted to ask other creatives, other people that are doing the things that inspire me. What's your process? How do you go about creating a song, a room, a recipe? So I feel like because at the core of what I do is curiosity, at the core of what I share is process. I never wanted to just share beauty. I wanted to distill beauty and share the principles at play. So even my book, Live Beautiful, I'll share these beautiful spaces that some incredible designers have designed, but it wasn't just to like share for the sake of beauty, to just say, that look at this beautiful, unattainable home. It was like, okay, let's look at this image. Let's kind of share the principles at play and distill for the reader how they can achieve, not the exact space, but the principles of why the design works. I feel like what has worked for me is really being authentic and sharing and being transparent, whether that is my my creative process or my own insecurities or my own pitfalls. Everybody just needs to find what is their authentic voice and to share that. And your community is this back and forth. It's an energy. It's an ecosystem. Where do you think the future of design is going? I would just love any of the the predictions you have for how design is becoming more accessible, how it's becoming maybe democratized. Those are my words, not yours necessarily. How do you think about where design is headed? Have their homes be this sense of expression to tell their story. If you buy everything from my Crate and Barrel collection, it's going to look boring. But if you buy a piece from my collection and a vintage piece that you find, you know, at a thrift store, and then you have a family heirloom that you update in a modern fabric, different periods, different, you know, wood finishes, different materiality, that's what makes a house a home because it's telling your story. Pieces that come from your travels, pieces that are a family heirloom. I'll also say that I think that design is in the precipice of a change that is becoming more layered, more eclectic, more unstudied. We're not really seeing all neutrals anymore. We're not seeing all bleached woods anymore. I feel like there's a richness right now. And, you know, I love to follow trends. I love to see what's happening culturally. You know, I go to Salone and Milan every year. And, you know, it's very interesting to see, like, all of a sudden, rich, dark wood and paneled walls and, you know, darker, saturated fabrics. And there's just a richness to design right now and an eclecticism. Can you give us a sense of just a few brands that you love, high and low? So brands that you love, a few high, a few low that you get inspired by. I shop a lot on first dibs, which is, I know, very high. I also love to, like, I'm a big lover of vintage, not only for sustainability, but also to have things that are unique and that not everybody else has. So I'm obsessed with the auction sites. I'm on live auctioneers all the time. You know, note to everyone out there, once you win something, you still have to pay a 30% premium to to just like whatever you're paying, know that it's going to be 30% more than that often. Um, (laughs) I learned that the hard way. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. I want to transition to you. Is there any other principle or memory from your childhood that you really draw on today now that you're in your fullest, executing at your most authentic self and thriving? 
that you look back on and you're like, that moment almost feels like a direct line. Both of my parents were hairdressers. So I grew up around, I didn't know that it was like a creative community, but I grew up around people that like had a love of beauty, had a love of aesthetics, had a love of flamboyance sometimes. So I feel like everybody was very much the salon. I, my dad had his own salon and I grew up pushing hair and getting my makeup done. And, you know, I just feel like there was just this access to creative expression. I will say that my mom would always take such love and care and attention to setting the table and the ceremony of setting a table for the holidays and for Thanksgiving specifically. Thanksgiving was always in our home. And, you know, my mom would always, you know, she would wake up at 5 a.m. and the turkey was always perfectly golden and the table and her and I would set the table and press the linens and do the flowers. And I didn't know it at the time, but I mean, it's very much an extension of who and what I am right now. It's never just the table and just the design design, but it's also, you know, the attention that goes into crafting and, and creating a meal. And it's the ceremony of gathering around the table. So I grew up in an Italian American family. We did not have an abundant amount of money and nothing was fancy, but like things were always done beautifully and with attention and care. So I think that that is something that very much has attributed to my love of entertaining and design and creating. You and your husband are both incredibly creative, your husband being a really talented musician and artist. You guys have worked together and collaborated a lot. Yes. What makes that effective uh, secret to working together? What are your secrets to collaboration? Because something magical happens. What is it? Well, Victor and I, I'll, first, I'll say first and foremost that we were best friends before we were a couple. We've been married. We just celebrated 24 years of marriage and wow. we've been together for 27 years. So um, we're really good at, A, knowing each of our roles. Like I feel like, you know, he's more on the technical side of things because we've done a lot of renovations together. Like uh, for me, real estate is just as exciting as, as design and we push each other and we challenge each other. And I'm usually leading, pushing the boundaries on like the creative vision. And he's usually leading with project managing and, you know, all of like the finer details and profiles. So like a perfect example is like my Brooklyn, our Brooklyn townhouse that we um, just recently sold and really was part of what launched my career, I would say in the past eight years was, was that townhouse. He wasn't ready to sell it. So I think that, you know, there are times that I push him and make him feel a little uncomfortable. And he's, there's times that he pushes me. And I think that we always hear one another. We always listen to one another. And so many people say that a renovation is, you know, a precipice for, for divorce. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, things definitely get uncomfortable. I never want to be complacent. I always want to push boundaries. I always want to iterate. I always want to create something new. And I think that we're really good at doing that together. And, you know, I sometimes he's not there and I am there. And, you know, I have to be patient until he gets there. The people that ended up buying our townhouse kind of hated us because we ended up going into contract and then backing out of the sale because Victor and my son were ready to sell and I was. So you have to hear your family members, right? Like I was so clear that I needed a new creative vision, a new canvas for me to design and create something new, but my family wasn't. So we backed out of a deal, you know? So I think you always have to hear the other person. And I think that that's important in business. It's important in a marriage. It's important in friendship. You have to um, you have to be symbiotic, you know, in every relationship in your life. It's it's a give and take. Give us a, like just a tip or a trick or something that you do to stay sane. How do you keep Athena on the tracks? I mean, it's not easy, Alexa. Really, you know, I <laughs> I sometimes I sometimes say to my team, like, guys, we I need to like build in a time to take my dog for a walk or to go have lunch, you know, or just to order lunch. Like I feel like my days have gotten so scheduled and I've, I have to be honest, as I've grown the e-com side of things, I've lost a little bit of the breadth of space that creativity requires. And I'm still figuring that out, but I have begun to put blocks in my, you know, I, <laughs> I, I used to have like somebody on my team block, you know, an hour or 30 minutes or an hour and a half to, for creative time. 
creativity doesn't happen in an hour and a half. So I'm trying right now to block full days or, you know, four to six hours for me to, whether it's to write or whether it's to be in the kitchen and develop a recipe or whether it's just to like walk along the waterfront and dream a little bit because dreaming is part of what I've always done. And you don't have the ability to dream in 15 minute fragments in between Zoom calls. So... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> amen. Amen, sister. I could, I mean. So I guess I'm a work in progress. I'm figuring it out. It's, it's hard because I'm growing a business and I'm trying to like potentially, you know, hire more and have a president and raise capital and grow. So there's like uh, investors and equity and lawyers and, you know, that doesn't always allow for creativity. So the past year has been very business focused. I'm trying to find middle ground to stay true to my creative side. So blocking out creative days is something that I do. I will not look at my emails after like 6 or 7 p.m. after dinner. I don't look at emails. I won't look at my phone when I first wake up. I will, whether it's meditate or I've been doing journaling in the morning, but uh, morning pages, morning pages. <laughs> I've been writing my morning pages in the morning, not every day. Um, I've been making sure I work out. I've been trying at least like five days a week to work out. And then my weekends, I hold incredibly sacred. I don't make plans. I allow the days to be very free. I try not to work at all. So so these are these are ways to try to stay sane. Athena, I'm going to move to the quick fire round. I'm going to ask you a question. First thing that comes to your mind, there's no right or wrong answers. What gets you out of bed every day? My puppy. What is a quote that has stuck with you? It can be a quote, a mantra, anything, but something that you really hold near and dear. I always say at the core of what I do is simple ideas, thoughtfully executed. Is there a book of any kind that has left a big impact on you? Mary Oliver, the poetry of Mary, Mary Oliver is something that I constantly go back to. Why I Wake Early is, is one of her books that I am constantly going to. So yeah, the poetry of Mary Oliver. I like it a lot. What is one category of innovation that you're fascinated by right now? Of any, it can be anything. I am kind of fascinated by AI, but I don't know that I want to participate. I, but I also don't want to be so close-minded or <laughs> such a granny that I don't participate, but I can't really tell how it's going to affect design. First of all, I love, I love that you're like a granny. You're never able to be a granny. <laughs> what is an interview question you like to ask people to really get to know them? What was something that you realized that you were fearful of that helped teach you something? Because like I can pinpoint when I tried to move past my fears, when I let my fears fuel me instead of letting it halt my forward momentum. So I think that that's like really interesting to kind of like identify like something that held you back that you have moved past and how it helps fuel you, what you learned from that. There's something about you. You really confront your fears. Like there's something so deeply brave about you. You really, you are somebody who goes through things instead of around them. I'm just going to share this one thing. When I started iSwoon, I have a huge insecurity around education because I never finished college. And self-education is really what propelled me forward and helped me find iSwoon. I was a young mom at home and I started to self-educate by obsessively reading recipes and teaching myself culinary techniques and also reading about design and prolific designers and studying images. So I feel a sense of pride in myself and what I do because I self-educated. When I started iSwoon and I needed to start writing. It wasn't always the images. It was also the writing. I would find that I was always put off. I would put off the writing. I would love to kind of like pull the images together and think through what the concepts were. But when I actually had to write, I would just always procrastinate. And it was because of this idea that I didn't, I wasn't grammatically correct and that I wasn't educated enough and articulate enough or I didn't have like the vocabulary. And I identified something about myself and it helped me push through it. I will, oh, this fear will always rise up within me and I have the option to let it halt me or push me forward. And I, it was this aha moment where I was like, oh, okay. 
every time I sit to write, this is going to come up. I'm going to tell myself I suck. I'm going to tell myself I'm not educated. I'm going to tell myself I don't understand grammar, that somebody can do it better. All of a sudden, I would sit down and force myself to stop listening to those voices. And then it would just flow out of me. And I would be so passionate and so fired up. And I would be like, okay, so she's always going to come and I'm always going to ignore her because she's not going anywhere. And Alexis, she still comes up, you know, like she's always there. And I just don't let it stop me anymore. The one subject I loved in school was actually writing, but I just never felt great enough about it. And I think if I knew what an editor was, I would have worked in a magazine and become an editor, but I didn't know that that exists. And what's really interesting is that I love to package ideas and push culture forward. And I'm an editor. And in a weird way, what I do as a creator and what editors do and I'm a media company and a media company is me. A media company is trying to be, create content and I'm trying to be a media company. And like the lines are blurred and like, you know, content and storytelling and community and culture and pushing ideas forward and sharing and learning is just, that is at the core of who I am and what iSpoon is. I think, Athena, that is one of the coolest, most genuine narratives that I've heard ever on my podcast, which is that we all have a little voice in ourselves that says X, Y, or Z, and that you learn to say, you will always come here and I will ignore you, and that that was power. Thank you. I love that because everybody listening can viscerally follow that advice, which brings me to my absolute last question of today, which is you've had so many fun moments in your career. If you have to name one, your biggest pinch me moment, a moment where you were like, oh my God, I can't believe this, this happened. What was it? First one was winning the James Beard Award for my, my book, Cook Beautiful. Because when I started writing that cookbook, I didn't know anything about writing a recipe. I was already sharing recipes on iSwoon, but like the trajectory of growth, I love to track growth and I love to always learn. I love to not know something and figure it out. And I knew nothing when I wrote that cookbook. I knew nothing about writing recipes. I knew nothing about cre- creative direction or art direction. You know, I was making it up as I went along and it was a, a, a James Beard Award for the photography. So technically my photographer won the James Beard Award for my book, but The journey of writing that book and the not knowing and then the knowing and then to be celebrated for it was a huge moment. And then the second one was the Crate and Barrel collection because Amy Astley wrote the foreword to my design book and she wrote something like, Athena wants everyone to have what she's having, that I'm not stingy with my information. And that was true in the book that I wrote, but it was also true in this collection because I wanted for people to have access to beautiful design and things that didn't look like it came from just like one obvious collection. I wanted it to feel international and global. And I wanted other people to have these pieces that were unattainable or even just so rare that they weren't available. Most most of the collection came from vintage pieces I collection collected over time. So I'm very proud to have given access to beautiful design to so many people. And I don't take it lightly when people save their money enough to invest in a piece that is going to live on in their home for 10, 15, 20 years. That's a huge decision. And to know somebody might buy a sideboard that, you know, their kid is going to have memories of, you know, running their truck underneath it and through it and, or their Barbie dolls like sitting on it, like, that's like a really intimate and personal and beautiful moment to know that something that I design is going to live on in people's lives and in their memories. You are like literally walking in the footsteps that you're supposed to. That is just a really fun thing to get to listen and watch. Athena, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, This has just been such an honor because as I said, I'm such a genuine fan and I love what you do and you've made my life better through getting to know you. And so I just want to say thank you so much. And everybody out there, if you haven't already checked out iSwoon, run, don't walk, buy the books, enjoy. (laughs) Life can be better. It can be more beautiful across all budgets. Um, And Athena will leave you there. So thank you so much for joining today. We are rooting for you. I'm sincerely so grateful. Oh, thank you so much, Alexa. I loved this conversation so much.